Tonight, as Germany slips closer to social disorder, you won't believe the latest comments from Angela Merkel. It's February 4th, and you're watching The Ezra Levant Show. Why should others go to jail Why? when you're a biggest carbon Thanks consumer so. I know? There's 8,500 customers here, and you won't give them an answer. You come here once a year with a sign, and you feel morally superior. The only thing I have to say to the government for why I publish it is because it's my bloody right to do so. The mass migration of young, single, military-aged Muslim men into Europe is a disaster, and nowhere more so than in Germany, where Angela Merkel, who has no children in real life, has the new nickname Mutter Merkel, which means Mother Merkel. There's something psychologically perverse going on here. A chancellor of Germany with no personal future, no stake in Germany's future, who has chosen to adopt millions, all of whom happen to be young Muslim men. Many Germans have psychological issues, a deep self-hatred, a Selbsthass, unresolved issues from Nazism in their country 75 years ago. It's not just Merkel, of course. Her predecessor, Gerhard Schrader, had no kids either. Both tried to denaturalize Germany and blend it into Europe, and then to blend Muslim Turkey into greater Europe. German self-loathing is one thing. Most Western liberal democracies suffer from a form of it, but... Germany more so than any other. Suicide is a crime as well as a moral sin. But what do you call it when you yourself insist on living, but you choose to end your line en masse, terminate your entire nation? Well, you call it Germany that now has the lowest birth rate in the world. This is not the result of a medical problem. It is a psychological problem, a cultural problem, the word nation is related to the words nature and NATO, which mean birth and renewal and life. Merkel literally despises Germany's Germanness, as you can see in this bizarre video we just played there. Her treatment of her own country's flag that she throws away when handed it, as if it were poisonous. Oddly, her population reduction plan only applies to ethnic Germans and other Europeans that she is flooding with her new surrogate children. She loves the streaming hordes of young, overwhelmingly Muslim men from Syria, but also from Turkey and Iraq and Somalia and North Africa, and really any Muslim who wants to come in. They are not refugees by any stretch of the definition. They are migrants, but even that doesn't properly describe who they are. They are an army of young men with all that means. They're full of testosterone which means fighting and sex. Male instincts that have been restrained in the West by cultural concepts like the rule of law and chivalry towards women and, frankly, the self-imposed customs and obligations that come with Western citizenship in a liberal society. But Merkel has destroyed those and invited in people who believe in Sharia law and what comes with that, namely that secular law is not to be obeyed and infidel women are theologically dirty so they can be physically abused with impunity. Thus, the mass rapes across Europe on New Year's Eve. Now, surely that bothers Merkel. Surely, as the first woman chancellor, the irony cannot have escaped her that she, a woman, has brought rape and fear to German women unseen since the Soviet Red Army raped its way to Berlin to avenge Stalingrad. Look at how tired she looks, worn out, distracted, stressed, even captured in her official Time Magazine Person of the Year cover, surely she cannot be blind to the crime and carnage that has wrecked her country, the street battles. She is an avowed anti-Nazi, of course, or at least against Nazis of the white variety. She hides her eyes from the Nazi-like anti-Semitism and street gangs that have come with Germany's new residents, though. Merkel's an anti-Nazi, but surely she cannot help but to notice that her reckless policies and her marginalization of anyone who wants a more moderate approach to immigration and Islam, that it is she and her policies who have in fact provided a rebirth to Nazism and white nationalism, as Germans realize that the authorities, the police, the politicians, the press, civil society, they won't help. They will only demonize victims of Muslim aggression as racists. They will put political correctness above the safety of German women. 
If Merkel has no help for raped German women, if Merkel won't stop the mobs of Muslim men, there are other less savory sorts who will step up and fight, street gang to street gang. Angela Merkel is the Mutter of a neo-Nazi rebirth too. Well, look, not everyone wants to use the German nation as a personal psychotherapy experiment. And even many fellow liberals draw the line at emotional self-loathing as opposed to mass rapes and violence. So some of Merkel's own party members are starting to press her to stop this madness. So last week, she made an announcement. She will continue to let in young Muslim men by the million. She will continue to have open borders, no vetting, first come, first served, survival of the fittest, no language skills, no job skills, no cultural skills, no acceptance of Germany's customs. She'll keep all that. Her concession was to announce that these millions of Muslims, um, they'll have to go home after the wars are over. <laughs> Seriously. Well, I guess the first point would be who? Germany has just lost track of 600,000 of these latest Muslim migrants. No clue where they are. They could be in Germany. They could be somewhere else. So good luck with those 600,000. But what about the other millions? So after welcoming them to Germany, Germany unconditionally and telling them that they are her children and they belong to Germany, that's her phrase, now she's just expecting that they'll pick up and leave. Her in what army? But of course she doesn't mean it. It doesn't even make sense. When the wars are over, they'll go home. Wars in Muslim countries, they never end. They are in a constant struggle against each other or against themselves or dictators against their own populations. What would it even mean for the war to be over in Afghanistan or Somalia? And that's another point. Many of the Muslim migrants in Germany are not from Syria. They just said they were to get in unconditionally. They're from two dozen different Muslim countries. They're from Turkey. The Muslim rapists in Cologne on New Year's Eve were predominantly from North Africa, places like Morocco and Tunisia and Algeria. What war is Merkel talking about there? Look, she doesn't mean it. She's troubled. She's stressed. You saw those pictures of her. Surely she sees she's ruining her country, dividing her country, radicalizing her country, bringing violence to it and fear. She's just saying this to buy time, but doesn't she know, doesn't she know the war, the war she's talking about? It's not just in Syria now. It's not just over there now. The war, why Angela Merkel has brought the war into the heart of Germany. That's where the war is now. She's the one who opened the gates to the invaders. Stay with us for more. I love Alberta. I've lived here my whole life and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of our free market, pro-business, low-tax, do-it-yourself attitude. And now, I'm watching my province get destroyed. We've all had hints of the NDP's radical views in the past, but no one actually thought they'd ever run this province. Not even them. And now they are. And the worst is yet to come. I give my sad forecast for Alberta in my new ebook, The Destroyers, Rachel Notley and the NDP's War on Alberta. Go to thedestroyers.ca to sign up for your free copy today. Welcome back to the program. One of the things that uh, motivates me here at The Rebel, but also frustrates me, is how few media outlets cover the truly dangerous issues of our time. Uh, that's why I focused on the story of Roosh V yesterday, is because all this mania and panic and moral outrage over a harmless blogger is so obviously a sublimation, in my view, of people who are afraid to say anything about real mass rapes and sexual assaults going on across Europe. I can find no other explanation for why the same social justice warriors who are on high alert 
over a blogger are silent about mass rapes in Europe. And joining me now is one of the few people I look to on a daily basis for the kind of news I can't find anywhere else. His name is Oliver Lane, and he's an editor at Breitbart London. He joins us now via Skype. Oliver, what a pleasure to meet you. And a pleasure to be on the show. Good, uh, good afternoon. Thank you. I mean, you are... I mean, you're part of the Breitbart London team. We know Simon Kent is with you, other friends like James Dellingpole and Raheem Kassam. Your specialty is following the news of the Million Muslim March uh, through Europe. It was you who broke the news in the English language of the 1,000-person sexual assault in Cologne, Germany on New Year's Eve. Tell us how you did that. How did you find the news that the rest of the media was suppressing? Well, half of my job every day is scanning all of the European local newspapers, the small places that other media groups wouldn't necessarily look to think, local blogs, local interest. And that means we can get those sorts of stories days before the national news media, uh, if they decide to cover them at all. In fact, by the time we got the news of Cologne at Breitbart London, it was already some days after the fact now, the German news media knew about it, but they decided not to report on it. So we broke that story in English. And as you know, it then went global. Yeah. I mean, that was what was so incredible there. I mean, it's one thing to miss a story, but it's another thing to deliberately cover up a story. When you have a thousand, the facts are there are now more than 1,000 German women who have complained of being raped. And of course, more than a thousand uh, suspects. You cannot have a story of that magnitude in a city like Cologne without many thousands of people knowing about it, in the media and police included. They deliberately chose to lie, including the police department, to put out a false press release the next day saying the evening was uneventful and relaxed. Let me ask you a key question, Oliver. It's one thing for the media to ignore the story. How big a problem is actual disinformation and censorship when Google or Facebook or YouTube literally black out or censor stories that are politically incorrect? Uh, well, we know all about what uh, Facebook is doing now to uh, censor stories in Germany, at least. I think exactly what's going on in the rest of the world is yet to be seen. Um, but I think an important story we're seeing this week, um, which I broke in the English language media yesterday, um, is of Dr. Wolfgang Helles, who is a, a former station chief with the uh, uh, German uh, Zeitdeutsche uh, Fernheim, uh, ZDF, which is kind of like the CBC or the BBC. Um, and he uh, admitted on live air that uh, German uh, news media, especially the, uh, the mainstream media that's actually owned by the German state was taking orders directly from the German government, not just on how to report stories, uh, but actually what stories to report or what to ignore. Um, his comments, I think, are very well timed, actually, and you know, he now has the liberty to make them as a retired member of staff. Um, but uh, yeah, this is coming just three weeks after the same station, ZDF, was forced to make a groveling apology to the German people for completely ignoring the Cologne rape story. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you are breaking these stories, and I can only imagine the amount of traffic you are getting simply because people crave the truth. And, you know, I, I wonder how the mainstream media, or what I sometimes call the media party, people who are conducting themselves as if they're a political entity, a campaign group themselves, how have the mainstream media responded to Breitbart in particular and you and your focus on the, the Muslim migrants? Have you been disparaged? Have you been marginalized? Have you been copied? Uh, what, what do the leading papers of London do uh, about you? Well, I think it's clear to say that um, the mainstream media in the UK really don't know what to say about Breitbart. Um, you have right-wing newspapers in the UK, like The Express, for instance, um, which shamelessly rip off our stories and then fail to credit us. Of course, they put in the credits two days later on their online coverage once we've emailed them and said, actually, you've lifted word for word our coverage, just copy and pasted whole paragraphs for your own newspaper. Um, but then you also have newspapers like the Daily Mail um, and independent television, ITV over here, who refer to us as a German newspaper. 
um, it seems our coverage of German news is so present. They think we're actually a German company, whereas uh, Breitbart is American, but obviously it's got a, a German a German name, which is given from the man who founded the company, as your uh, viewers will know. Um, so yeah, quite amusing really how they um, have completely misjudged what Breitbart is, where it's come from, and what it's doing. Isn't that funny? I had the pleasure of interviewing Andrew Breitbart a couple of times before he passed away. And so I knew him as this big, brawling Los Angeles, in-your-face conservative. It's, it's funny to me. Uh, I can imagine in Europe, where they had never knew of the man himself, they see the word Breitbart, and they assume it's a German news. That's very funny. I yeah. never even thought of that. But it, that's a credit to you and your team. Listen, yeah, you can see I'm a, I'm a total fan here. Um, how have any authorities responded? I mean, by the way, let me just give a shout out. You have a, you call it a live wire, don't you? It's where all your migrant oriented stories are compiled in one place. That's an outstanding resource. Um, how have authorities dealt with you? Have you uh, received any uh, threats or comments or interventions by, uh, by a would be censor, by some uh, agency, by a police accusing you of some hate speech. I'm just curious because here in Canada, we have something called the Human Rights Commissions uh, and we actually have hate propaganda laws on the books. Have you been subject to or threatened by any such things where you are? Well, we're very fortunate at Breitbart um, with, or in Breitbart London because of our um, American roots, the American headquarters. We also have uh, very good American lawyers. Um, so we tend to be quite fearless of what we put out and um, trouble like that is put aside. Um, our staff have trouble, of course, not from um, the government per se, but um, you, know, you might call them leftist agitators, um, you know, abuse, hacking attempts, that sort of thing. But... Um, it's nothing we can't handle. Yeah. Well, Oliver, I really enjoyed getting to know you a bit. I know you from your byline. I admire your work and those of your team. I wish you good luck and uh, we'll be reading and following from here. That's for sure. Oliver Lane, editor of Breitbart UK. Stay with us, folks. After the break, I talk about free speech in Cape Breton. Don't go away. That's next. Looking for the perfect gift? Did you know the Rebel.media has a store? Make a statement with a t-shirt. Have your morning coffee in a fearless travel coffee mug. There's even an Ezra LeVant bobblehead. It's a one-stop shop for the perfect gift. And don't forget to pick up something for yourself. Go to the Rebel.media slash store to find out more. Ontario residents are being hosed on electricity prices. The latest Auditor General's report says we've been overcharged by $37 billion over the last several years. That works out to nearly $2,800 for every man, woman and child. Why? Mismanagement and bad policy choices from the Ontario Liberals. It's going to cost us billions more in coming years. Energy Minister Bob Shirelli won't take responsibility. He's lashing out. It's time for Bob to go. If you agree, go to firebob.ca. That's firebob.ca and make your voice heard. Welcome back to the program. Is freedom of speech under attack? Well, of course it is. It always is, and most of the time, in the name of do-goodery. People trying to solve some genuine problem, but they throw out the freedom baby with the bathwater. Well, joining us now via Skype from Cape Breton University is the Students' Union out there, Brandon Ellis. Welcome to the show. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well, Asper. Thank you for having me. Well, you reached out to me and you said you were concerned about the state of freedom in your province because of the overreach in the cyberbullying law. Now, anyone who cares about freedom of speech is a friend of mine, but I got to say, before we get into the subject matter of our discussion today, I find it unfortunately rare to see a student union leader who cares about freedom of speech. In my anecdotal observation, Many student union leaders are for the forces of political correctness and social justice, and they put freedom of speech much lower down in the hierarchy. Tell me a little bit about yourself and why you love freedom and why you reached out to me. 
Well, I believe in the uh, the Constitution here in Canada. I believe in the Charter of Rights, and uh, I, I've reached out because I feel that uh, some of our rights here in Atlantic Canada, Canada have been violated with the uh, recent cyberbullying legislation. Uh, I completely agree with you that a lot of student leaders are unfortunately on the side of uh, political correctness, and uh, my, my good friends at the Canadian Federation of Students uh, typically lead the charge. Uh, with that. Um, fortunately, though, I've, uh, I've taken a more pragmatic approach to my education here at uh, Cape Breton University and uh, my education as a student leader as well. I know there's not just one side to everything. Uh, I, I, I tell you the truth, Ezra, I spend quite a bit of time uh, watching Rebel Media videos and uh, Lauren Southern in particular. I oh, find she's great. That she's doing uh, is really good in the name of free speech and uh, she's doing a lot of uh, positive work on university campuses as well. So I'm a big fan and a big, big supporter of free speech overall. Well, that's amazing. I, I tell you, I have uh, never heard those words spoken by a student leader before. So this is, a, this is a rare day for me, and I thank you for your kind words. Let's move on to the substance of what you contacted me about. Listen, the case of Retea Parsons was shocking and tragic and infuriating. And, and that's that, you know, in the name of fixing a problem in the name of healing some hurt censorship laws can come forward and in this case cyberbullying i mean who could be against banning cyberbullying but when you try and define it you're really building a censorship law can you bring me up to speed brandon about someone in your community who has been targeted by this cyberbullying law you sent me the case but i know you know it better than me could you describe it for our viewers yeah and i only know so much of it as well um but, but essentially, uh, a, a friend of mine, a neighbor of mine, has uh, had his freedom of uh, speech greatly limited by the powers of the province. Uh, he was uh, dismissed from his uh, position of work for uh, trying to unionize, ironically, and uh, they, they, they let him go, and he decided to take his uh, frustrations to social media. Uh, with respect to uh, why he was let go, some of the unsafe uh, working conditions at uh, that particular employer. And uh, he was all for intents and purposes a whistleblower. And uh, he, he took to Twitter, he took to Facebook, any means of social media that he could find. And uh, before he knew it, he had representatives from the province knocking on his door, uh, looking to speak with him and uh, greatly discouraging him from expressing his beliefs. Uh, they knocked on his parents' door and uh, tried to intimidate them as well. And unfortunately, his father uh, ended up passing away a week later after the uh, cyber scan unit ended up uh, uh, visiting his parents. Um, the, the level of harassment that this individual has faced has been uh, a borderline criminal, in my opinion, and has been greatly limiting to free speech. Well, now let me ask you a few questions. I mean, cyberbullying, the way... I understood it when these laws were being proposed to stop high school girls from being picked on, to stop sexting pictures from being stolen and published to the internet, violations of privacy, you know, uh, extortion, that sort of thing, protecting kids. I mean, normally when we use the phrase bullying or cyberbullying, we're talking about children that need some protection. We're not talking about grown-ups, and we're certainly not talking about institutions like companies or the, the, pro, the provincial government uh, claiming that a grown man who's making a political complaint or a workplace complaint or a political complaint is cyber bullying the world. It, it just seems so, such a stretch, but that's the problem with censorship. You bring in a rule and people sort of check it out and game it and say, well, how can I use cyber bullying in my case? And you have police or prosecutors or activists whose living depends on stretching the law so they can stay busy. It, uh, you haven't said the name of this person, and I, I mean, if, I don't know if there's a reason for that, but it, the way you've described it, and, and you sent me some more details on the case, it, it, is that this is a, a regular dispute where people can disagree, but instead of dealing with the substance of it, the government is going to clam him up. It's just so obviously an abuse. Is anyone coming to his aid? Um, he has been meeting with uh, the province. He attempted to meet with uh, the Minister of Justice. He went up to her constituency office about a week ago. 
Uh, he's spoken with a few other provincial MLAs, and I'm sure they're doing the best they can. Uh, and Ezra, he has fully given me permission to say his name. His name is Rob Romart, so I encourage any of your viewers to uh, check him out. He is uh, very, very strong in his political beliefs. Uh, he believes in holding government accountable, and uh, I, I really hope that uh, the province takes a better look at this and takes a better look at what the Justice Department is doing. I feel that they've crossed the line on several levels. And I also agree with the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia when they said that this legislation was a colossal failure. Uh, I believe it is a colossal failure and it's an injustice to free speech. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Romard would greatly agree as well. Well, listen, I'm glad you reached out. It's so encouraging to me to find a student leader who cares about freedom and is as articulate about it and brave. I mean, it's not even the articulateness. It's the fact that you dare say these things. I hope you're not punished uh, by anyone for, for daring to come on our show. Well, you've given our viewers a bit of a tantalizing brief about this case. I'm going to immerse myself in the subject some more and maybe reach out to the censored person himself, it's not even the subject matter that's of interest to me, whether or not he wanted to unionize or what his politics are. That's irrelevant because, as they say, freedom of speech is the gift you have to give your opponent if you want it for yourself. And nothing terrifies me more than government knocking on your door because you've written something. Last word to you, Brandon. Do you think freedom of speech is on the march? Do you think tools like Twitter and Facebook and, and other technologies have given us more freedom of speech? Or do you think just as fast as those have grown, the state has grown in its tools to censor? And, and the fact that we're concentrated in a few social media platforms, Google, Facebook, you know, Twitter, makes us more vulnerable to being cut off. Because if you're banned, you're banned. What, do you, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Uh, it's hard to say. On a university campus, I'm very fortunate that Cape Breton University has uh, great freedom of speech practices. I know we've taken some heat from the JCCF in, uh, in the past, but uh, I've never ever felt censored here on campus. Our school newspaper is moving to be independent as well, and uh, we as a student's union are supporting that. Um, but when I look uh, at some of my counterparts at other universities, particularly CFS schools, uh, I noticed that the censorship of free speech is uh, very prevalent there, yeah. uh, and, and that opinions are silenced, and uh, alternate views that uh, aren't as popular do not uh, are not welcome. Yeah. Uh, however, I do I, I am an optimist. I would like to see free speech, and I, I, th I think there's. Uh, something to be said for uh, people like you or people like the JCCF, for example, that hold certain institutions accountable. I think we need to be more accountable and we need to uh, encourage freedom of speech as opposed to limiting. And that's what a university campus is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about encouraging academics and creativity and freedom of thought. Yeah, right on. Well, Ben, I tell you, I could talk to you all day about these things. Uh, it's so refreshing to hear. I hope to make it out to Cape Breton myself one day. That's part of Canada I have not been to. I get the feeling it's beautiful. And the way you're talking is making me a fan of Cape Breton University. I'll tell you that right now. I hope this is not the last time we talk. I'll look further into the case you described. And you're such an articulate voice for freedom on campus. I hope you become a regular uh, correspondent with us. If there's anything that crosses your desk that you think the rest of the rebel nation should hear about, uh, consider this a standing invitation to come back on the show. Thank you very much, Ezra. It's been a pleasure. Right on. Nice to meet you. Stay with us, folks. After the break, your viewer feedback. I'm so open-minded that the brains have fallen out. What's the point that you're making? The point that I'm making is that if you're going to propose a massive overhaul to the way the economy is, is developed in terms of carbon tax, cap and trade, other forms like that, it helps to have some science that is in fact settled. We've heard you loud and clear. You can't get enough Canadian conservative news and opinion. Why not check out our blog? It's all your favorite conservative bloggers together on a page called The Megaphone. Go to the rebel.media slash The Megaphone or click on the Megaphone menu from our main page to check it out.
Welcome back. My favorite part of the show is viewer feedback. I didn't get a lot of feedback on my report about Rouge V, the so-called pickup artist who has put half a dozen countries into a frenzy, but I got some strong feedback. Here's Mona who says, F off, Ezra. I had respect for you, but now you've made me sick. I feel sorry for your daughter to have had that misfortune of having you as her dad. Have you done any research on Douche V? Have you read his blogs and you say he's not dangerous? If I was ever to meet this pile of SHIT, I promise you, he would never be able to rape again. His voice would end up being a few octaves higher, however. I suspect at some point in time, this boy will meet his end. And all I'll say is good riddance to that scum. I will no longer be sending the rebel any funds, nor will I be taking part in any of your causes. So just F off already. Well, tell me how you really feel. Actually, that's my first response. You don't mind being offensive yourself, swearing up a storm, making personal aspersions about me as a dad, etc. I don't mind. I've got a thick skin. I regard it as part of an emotional debate. But do you see my first point here? How can you choose to be so offensive and try and hurt my feelings and even make a sort of threat? I mean, oh, it's a pretend threat, I know, but still a threat to physically assault Roosh. How can you do all that? but then ask for someone to ban other people that you find offensive. Don't you see that when it comes to censorship, what comes around goes around? That free speech is the one thing we actually have to give to our opponents if we want it for ourselves. But I think I know why you're so mad. It's why the governor of Texas put out a press release on Rouge V, too. If you can believe it, that's incredible. I mean, now, hundreds of politicians and journalists have all joined this big conga line denouncing Ro Roosh as pro-rape. I mean, you say it too. You say he should never rape again as if he has raped anyone. Now, if that were true, I would share your rage and probably engage in some profanity too. And heck, just to prove how anti-rape I am, I might put out a press release confirming that I was anti-rape. But here's my quarrel with you. You ask me if I've done my research on Roosh, and I have. I've actually read his satirical essay about how to prevent rapes, where he engages in a thought experiment about how to make young women more careful about getting drunk and going back to a strange man's apartment. His thought experiment was the best way to scare away women from such risky hookup culture behavior would be to tell them that rape was legal on private property so they wouldn't go back to rooms with strange men. It was a dumb essay, not written particularly well, but it was clearly a satire in the vein of Jonathan Swift's essay called A Modest Proposal, where Swift suggested that we eat poor people, you know, to solve two problems at once. You don't have to agree that Roosh was funny. You just have to acknowledge that it was an attempted joke. So that's it. He's not a rapist. From what I can see, he does not propose rape. But if that's all you've heard, that he's a pro-rapist, then sure, you'd be furious. I know that Roosh is sexist and offensive to many, maybe most people. And that's it. And I know that if we start banning people who are offensive, then you're going to jail for offending me, and I'm going to jail for offending you, and we're all going to be living in an unfree world. Which brings me to our next letter. It's actually a press release put out last night by the Conservative Party's immigration critic, Michelle Rempel. Let me read the headline and first paragraph to you. Conservatives urge Minister McCallum to keep Roosh V out of Canada. And then it goes on. Today, Michelle Rempel, immigration, refugees, and citizenship critic, called upon the government to keep Canadian women safe and use ministerial discretion, such as the negative discretion authority, to deny Darius Valizade entry into Canada. Quote, his message is completely counter to Canadian values of gender equality and support for women's rights, unquote. Well, for starters, Rushfi is not coming to Canada any more than he's going to Texas or Australia or Holland or New Zealand or any one of other dozens of countries that have freaked out. But this was about virtue signaling, right? Showing that the conservatives can be social justice warriors too. Now again, I would agree if there really was a rapist or even someone saying he was going to commit a rape or promoting rape, I would agree if that's who was planning to come here. But I think that someone in the Conservative Party's research department might have actually just Googled for a minute to check who Rouge V was and realized he wasn't a rapist because the rationale offered in, in Rempel's press release was that Rouge has a message that is counter to Canadian values of women's rights. So two things here. We are right now as a country racing to import 50,000 Muslim migrants from Syria, which is one of the most sexist, 
misogynistic, homophobic, anti-Semitic backwards places in the world. I mean, talk about rape culture and honor violence and polygamy and women treated as the property of men, and we are scooping up 50,000 people from there and bringing them to Canada? So where is the vetting of them and their sexism? I mean, they would make Roosh look like Gloria Steinem by comparison. And that gets to my point yesterday about all the passionate concern over this one internet troll, Roosh V, is just sublimated concern for the rape of Europe that politicians and the media are too cowardly to criticize when it really counts. But my second point in response to Michelle Rappel's note is that I say this as a free speech advocate. What's the conservative government doing asking the Trudeau liberals to expand their power to say yes or no to visitors to Canada based on political views? Are you insane? Do you think it will only be sexist bloggers in the future? Do you doubt that conservatives will be on the liberal hit list? Maybe our friends Pamela Geller or Robert Spencer or Daniel Pipes or Geert Wilders from Holland or maybe the surviving staff of Charlie Hebdo. I mean, do you really want to give a government where Omar al-Jabra, the former president of the anti-Semitic Canadian Arab Federation, where he's the parliamentary secretary in charge of our foreign consulates, do you really want to give that guy discretion to block visitors to Canada based on politics? I'm embarrassed for the Conservative Party. This isn't about Rouge V. I don't care about him. This is about freedom of speech, the right to be offensive, the freedom to travel without harassment by busybody politicians. We've invited Michelle Rempel on the show to talk about this press release. I'll let you know if she accepts our invitation. I'm a bit skeptical. Okay, change the subject. Yesterday we announced a contest to scold the scolds. As in, Alberta launched a new nanny state initiative to scold people who keep their cell phones on their laps while they're driving. They call the campaign Crotches Kill and Alberta's NDP thinks that's a good use of taxpayers' dollars to run this whole campaign. Now, I am all for traffic safety. Of course I am. But what bugs me here is that this is just so fake. I mean, all the people who were posing for this campaign saying, don't use your cell phone, all these nanny staters, they're the worst offenders. So yesterday we devised a contest. If you can spot a police officer or a provincial MLA using their phone while driving, send it to us at tips at the rebel.media, and if it's a real picture, and if it's exclusive and you took it, we'll pay you a bounty, up to 250 bucks if you catch the premier's limo driver using his phone. Well, just a few hours after we released that video, we had our first entry. It was sent in by Nick, who writes, highway sheriffs of Sherwood Park, more like bikers with badges. And Nick sent this picture, and indeed that is an Alberta sheriff talking on his phone while driving. It also looks like he's been picking up his dry cleaning, too. Now, Nick, I certainly wouldn't go so far as to call that police officer a gang. That's not fair. But it is fair to point out when the nannies of the nanny state aren't following their own rules. So I'm going to cut you a check for 50 bucks, which is our bounty for pictures of police who are using their phones in their cars. Remember, folks, if you can find an MLA or a big city mayor or even a small city mayor, that's $100. And $250 if you catch the transport minister or the premier. You could just sit there at the legislature and take pictures. You could make a thousand bucks. Now, I am all for traffic safety. I just know that these posers who are nagging the rest of us, they really aren't for traffic safety, are they? Hey, that's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed watching it. What do you think about my talk about Angela Merkel? Don't you think it's odd that Germany, with the lowest birth rate in the world, who Chancellor Angela Merkel has no kids. The last Chancellor, Gerhard Schroeder, has no kids. They're bringing in a psychological replacement of a million Muslim men, and it's a disaster, and they know it, and they just won't stop it. What do you think of that? Send me a note at Ezra at the rebel dot media. Tweet me on Twitter, Facebook me, or make your comments below this video. That's it for today's show. I hope you enjoyed it. Tune in tomorrow, and until then, keep fighting for freedom.